So that was the state level. We'll next move to the institutional level. Our next speaker, John Houston, joins us from the great state of Pennsylvania, uh, in particular the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where he's the Vice President of Information Security and Privacy. Um, he's had a lot of experience there getting UPMC compliant with HIPAA, and he's testified several times before Congress on HIPAA privacy and security issues. Um, please join me in welcoming John Houston. Um, but nonetheless, I, I've really had to try to deal with uh, privacy compliance in a large institutional setting. Um, UPMC is about an $8 billion health system. I uh, have 14 hospitals and, and probably one of the most progressive uh, HIT strategies of anybody in the business. So I uh, had to deal with a lot of these issues that we've talked about. And it's interesting, the dialogue over the last day, um, there's a lot of commonality between what I'm going to talk about and what's been said already, though I think maybe I have a little bit of a different twist and I'm going to put things together in a little bit of a different order. And my talk is really based upon this observation, which is my observation which is that we really, I think, reached a tipping point where the volume and complexity of privacy regulations have made compliance extremely difficult. I mean, just think about what we've talked about, what Sally talked about. It's, it's incredible the amount of regulation and, and, and the difference between states. And so, again, I think we're at a tipping point. And what I have found through my time working with HIPAA and privacy laws is that even incredibly intelligent, well-educated and informed individuals, they don't necessarily understand the regulations. Um, and that's a problem. I, I probably find that I spend 25, 30% of my time either trying to clarify or correct people and how they view privacy and what we can and cannot do. And again, these, these aren't the, the registration people at the front desk. These are um, you know, physicians and, and attorneys and, and others and, and business partners, business associates. Um, it's, it's a real problem. And I think as a result, what we find is, is that many institutions are inappropriately implementing privacy regulations. Some are under-implementing, some are over-implementing, or some are just getting it wrong. And I think this is, this, as, we, as we layer more regulations on, I think we have to be very careful because I think we could be doing more and more damage. Now, Nicholas Terry talked about the, the, the four ages of privacy, and I, I decided I came up with the four ages of privacy, provider privacy regulation implementation. Um, I think the first is, is somewhat, is ignorance. You know, what is this regulation? And, and frankly, why do I have to comply with the thing? The next is denial is when you start reading the regulation, you say, you got to be kidding. Um, then they start, you question, you start to question and ask yourself, how am I going to actually implement this regulation and, and maintain some reasonable level of operational efficiency? And then the last is you sort of become apathetic about the whole thing and you say, well, I guess I'm going to need to implement this regulation. You're still sort of trying to figure out how, but nonetheless, you sort of get to the point where you say, okay, I just got to figure this out. Um, but it really, each time, you know, we, we went through this with HIPAA, then we went through this with the RRA privacy rule, and with each layer, it, it, it becomes more and more frustrating at times. Um, one of the realities, though, in healthcare um, is that timely, accurate, and complete information is necessary to provide efficient and effective care. And really, the challenge at the end of the day is is to provide the right information to the right individual at the right time. But I think having said that, though, we can't afford to wait to the last moment to give somebody information. We have to err on the side of, of probably providing too much information because, you know, I've, I've always said that if I had to explain to OCR why I allowed broad access to information, I'd rather do that than the alternative, which is explain to a family member why they're, they're, they're their loved one died when information could have been available to save them. So we have to develop uh, policies and procedures, processes in a, in a fashion that, that, uh, that assumes that, that sometimes you just need to have that information available. And towards that end, I, I think I define failure simply in terms of pa uh, impacting patient care. Now, a caveat to this is that I, I, 
I'm a strong advocate of privacy. Um, I think privacy is incredibly important. I look at Mark Rothstein, he's taught me an enormous amount of my time uh, working with him. Um, but we still have to look at it in the context of impacting patient care. And I think sometimes people lose sight of that. Um, patients often don't really know what they want. And I'll give you a great example uh, of, of this. I got a call a couple years ago from a gentleman who said, I read the article in the newspaper about how UPMC is implementing an electronic health records environment, and I want you to delete my records from that environment. So I talked to him for a while, and I asked him, I said, well, if you're driving down the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and God forbid you're in an accident, and you're unconscious, and are taken to our hospital in, in Bedford, Pennsylvania, and you're in the emergency department, do you want that physician to have access to your record? And he said, absolutely, without a doubt. And I said, well, you just told me to delete all your records. So sometimes, you know, you, you, yes, you have to put privacy and security in place and, and, and try to put the checks and balances in place. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we still need to have that information in order to, to, uh, to deliver care. And I think one of the other issues that I see, too, is that, that, that providers often put in place arbitrary and overly restrictive barriers. They do things that they don't need to do, and frankly, that often, often imp impacts care. And, and what HIPAA says is, at the end of the day, is that we need to take reasonable steps. But again, if we've got to err, we have to err in the benefit of, of, of patient care, in my mind. So I, I think at the end of the day, from my perspective, privacy is a balance. And it's a, it, it's a balance between three things. It, it, the individual absolutely has a right to have his or her information kept confidential, but a provider needs to have that information in order to deliver care. And then there are other societal interests at play as well. And we really haven't talked a lot about those, but you know, there are public health considerations, um, you know, population health, um, quality assurance type of activities. So privacy is not an absolute in my mind. It's a balance. And it's a difficult balance that I think a lot of times we get wrong. And not always to the positive. End of the day, you know, in good faith, people have really a substantial difference in the way they view privacy. I, I made this statement last night, a, a rather provocative statement. We were out at dinner, and I said, I don't care who sees my record. You can post it on a, on a bulletin board. You can put it on the Internet. I don't care. But I don't have anything to hide. But I certainly want to make sure that if a physician who's caring for me needs to have access to my information, I certainly want to make sure he has it or she has it. However, I also respect the fact that there are many individuals who have stigmatizing conditions. They have, uh, they have illnesses that maybe they could be uh, discriminated against for. And so I take that very seriously as well. And the problem is, is how do you balance that? I don't want you know, the rules to, that are, are intended to protect those individuals to hurt me because maybe somebody in the future can't get information about me that I want to have available. And so it is a difficult balance. And, and, you know, we've talked about consents and authorizations and things like that. Those go some of the way, but I'm not sure that that, that is, in fact, a, a solution to, to trying to make information available. And the reality here, and I guess the reason why we're really here to talk is, is, is that, you know, the healthcare industry is, is, is moving quickly towards a highly integrated and a highly distributable, not distributed, but distributable electronic health records environment. And, you know, obviously there's, you know, with the High Tech Act and the, the, the move to, to, to make um, incentive payments to, to providers in order to implement electronic health records, it, we're going to have more and more issues. But as we implement electronic health records, I, I think we need to look at privacy in, in, a, in a different light. I mean, the way we view and have to address privacy is going to change. And, and what I mean by that is, and as I think Nicholas Terry said, is, is we have local versus global availability of information. And yeah, in, in the old days, it was, with a paper record, you locked the thing up in a file cabinet. You had, you know, had it locked in the medical records department. And you had islands of information. That information was locked down, but it frankly was of little good to anybody unless they had the key to the cabinet. And that didn't speak well to trying to improve patient care or improve efficiencies. And with all the talk, you know, about trying to, to, to reform healthcare and make it more efficient and trying to cover more individuals and, and try to reduce the costs, a big part of what we have to do is this move towards global availability. If, you know, at, at its core, 
the information needs to be accessible through an institution's electronic health records environment. Now, that's something I deal with every day. You know, again, with 14 hospitals and, and you know, thousands of employed physicians, we want to have all the information possible available to those people at all times in order to deliver care. But we're going to see this extend, and it's already extending into HIEs, health information exchanges, and in the future to NHIN or, or something on a national level. And I think that you know, these become much more heady issues. Uh, and I think that I'm not sure what the solutions are. I only, I'm only worried about trying to fashion a solution at, the, at, at a provider level, let alone at an HIE or a, a national level. But nonetheless, I think, you know, we have to view the way, we have to view privacy in a different light as we move into an electronic um, record environment. There's also a really big myth that I think has gotten, um, gotten propagated or uh, put into regulation, and it's that institutions all operate a single large monolithic computer system, an electronic health record system. And if you read the regulations, you'll, you'll see a lot of places where there's just an assumption that it's this big one, big computer, and that's not, that's not reality. I think what I've found is, is that in our, my organization, we have hundreds of systems that are used to deliver clinical care. And they all are tightly integrated together, but they're separate systems. But they're also um, systems that um, we also split out things like billing systems. And, and I'll give you an example. If you look at the last bullet point, there's a part of the new ARA privacy rule that says that an individual is entitled, if he pays for out of pocket in full for a particular healthcare service, that he has the right to prevent his health insurer to have access to that particular information. Now, that sounds pretty trivial on its surface. Well, in an environment where our clinical systems are separate from our billing systems, we don't, in our clinical systems, store how somebody paid for their, their services. That's in a separate system that's, that's you know, in no way connected to our clinical systems. So whenever we have to release information from a clinical system, how do we know how that person paid for it? Now, we've worked long and hard to figure out what operational processes are gonna be used in order to, to accomplish and to, to meet regulatory compliance, but it costs us hundreds upon hundreds of hours and work from probably 15 or 20 people to try to figure out how to do this. So, you know, while well intended, I think a lot of these rules, when you try to implement them in a large environment, become very, very difficult. Um, same thing with trying to perform accounting of disclosures. You know, how do we, under the ARA rule, we have to, to account for even disclosures that are electronic that are, are done in the, in the realm of uh, treatment or for payment purposes. And yet, when you have hundreds of systems potentially that are used to, to make those types of disclosures, how do you do the accountings? Very complex problem. So. Again, things are not all that easy if you, once you dig into the details. And I have to also warn you that, again, I'm allowed to say this because I have a degree in computer science, it's my undergrad, and uh, I have to give you the warning that computers are stupid. They don't think on their own. They, they do what you tell them to do. And we'd all like to think that, that computers have this magical capability to figure out things like when somebody should have access to records and, 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 and the like. The reality is, is they're stupid. And you know, if I look at the evolution of privacy in the HRs, uh, we're right at the beginning. I, 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 you know, you listen to Walter Suarez talk, and I think, you know, yeah, we're trying to lay the framework for, you know, dealing with issues of consent and how does that move along with data. But the reality is, is that's a long ways off from from really being something that I think is is implementable, especially in a large environment. We're way at the beginning. And we have to be very practical about how we try to accomplish things. And we also have to be very practical about what we can try to expect to try to do. And, um, you know, by example, yeah, you know, one of the provisions of HIPAA says that um, a patient's allowed to ask for a additional restrictions on his or her record. And the institution isn't required to accept those additional restrictions, but the patient's allowed to ask. My institution simply doesn't accept any type of, of additional restrictions. Not that we're bad people, but simply because of the fact that it would be impossible to honor those restrictions because of the size of our environment and the fact that we have so many different clinical systems and that our processes are so, so diverse and spread out. So you know, there are some real issues and, and I think we need to try to you know, keep things simple. And what I've said is I would rather have a good solid privacy um, practice 
that I stand behind and my patients can expect when they walk in the doors, here's how we're gonna treat their information and stand behind it and, you know, and then not accept any type of additional restrictions. The other issue I think is, again, we're in our infancy when it, when it comes to privacy and EHRs, but it's, it's difficult to develop and implement information system controls to support privacy, especially now while providing the flexibility that's necessary to, to deliver healthcare. These systems just aren't that advanced. And when we start to put up arbitrary barriers, um, what, what ends up happening is, is that we, we put structural barriers in place. And what I mean by that is, is if, oh, well, if it's psych data, we're gonna put it in a different system, or if we're gonna make a shadow record, or we're gonna keep a paper record instead. Because these systems, though as advanced as they may seem to be, don't handle gracefully often um, separating and segregating information. So, you know, what we end up with a lot of times is structural barriers. And that, in my mind, can do a lot of harm in terms of patient care. There's another issue too, and it's one of immediacy. Um, and what I mean by that is, is I work a lot with physicians almost on a daily basis to talk about how do we, how do we develop and, and implement our information systems to provide good quality information on a, on a moment's notice. And unfortunately, putting prospective controls in place, you know, break the glass and other things and structural barriers, they're intended to improve privacy. What you end up doing is impeding access to information. And sometimes when you have emergence uh, situations, um, it, it can be a problem. Also, it, it can reduce efficiency even, even when there is not an emergent circumstance. And when physicians are pushed and pushed more and more to be more and more productive, you know, putting barriers in place often has the opposite effect. It, it, it really can not only hurt efficiency, but it hurts patient care as well. And an example we've used, I think, <clears throat> throughout the last day is, is one of psychiatric information. And the question is, should psychiatric information be segregated? And, and I think, you know, the, the simple answer is yes. I think we all agree that any type of information that has additional sensitivity deserves some other type of protection. But, you know, as I think it was Mark Rothstein said, you know, information often results, psychiatric information often results from services provided by PCPs or an acute care setting. So it's not always just psych data. It's not data that's, that's for an encounter at a psychiatric facility. Um, there's many, many cases where a patient will have a, a psychiatric consult while in an acute care setting. And that information needs to be available to the people that, that ask for the consult. Um, well, I had a, a particular issue here um, within the last couple of weeks where the, the transplant team does a psychiatric evaluation for every transplant patient that goes through the program to determine whether they're suitable for transplantation. And the, the psychiatrists are saying, well, we, we don't think that should be in the record. But yet, if it's not in the record, there is absolutely no ability for the transplant team that's doing the suitability evaluation to decide whether that person, from a psychiatric perspective, should be, should, you know, have a transplant or is, is capable of, of handling a transplant. And the way we ended up dealing with that was simply because of the fact that there was already an authorization had to be signed in order to go through the evaluation. We added language to the authorization. But nonetheless, there are a lot of contexts where psychiatric information ends up in the record and needs to be in the record so people can see it. Again, access to psychiatric information in emergency situations is also an issue. Um, code situations in our facilities where, where you might have an intensivist literally go to a psychiatric unit in order to provide care because something's happened, somebody's coded. And yet, this was a major complaint was that they couldn't get at that information in order to be prepared when they, when they went on the code to, to, to deal with the, whatever, whatever they were gonna have to deal with. Their drug to drug interaction issues, I think it was brought up about how do you deal with the fact that somebody might be on a fairly strong uh, drug. Um, you know, um, in not, maybe not in that context of psychiatric information, but in the context of drug and alcohol uh, treatment, somebody could be on methadone. And, um, or they, they might be a recovering addict and yet they have a pain issue, a real pain issue. And you know, how does a, uh, does a, do if a doctor prescribes narcotics, it might be the wrong thing to do, but they still have to have their pain managed. So a lot of that information is necessary in order to deliver care. You know, and by the way, there could be other things such as alternative diagnoses. If you knew the background of an individual, it might give you a clue into what's really wrong with them. And then finally, you know, especially in the drug and alcohol treatment um, realm, um, it's not uh, uncommon to have people come in and try to divert, you know, to come in for, to, for drug diversion. They're looking for drugs. 
So, you know, having access to information is often very important to ensure you're providing the right treatment. And it all comes down to, and I don't know where we draw the line. Uh, we deal with it every day. It's value judgment. The line is gray. The line moves. It, it winds. You're trying to, in every case, trying to do the right thing, but there is no black and white rule, and there are no clear lines. And it's all judgment, and it's judgment. I, I deal with it every day. Uh, in the end, I think, though, there's one practical thing we can do today that, that I, I keep coming back to, and we can put a lot of technology in place to try to solve this problem, but I think that the, the, the most important thing that, that we can do as a, as a healthcare, as a profession, is deal with training. I think the area where that's where we're going to get the most bang for our buck is, is making sure that our workforce, frankly, continues to, to appreciate the, 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 the value of privacy and, and respect people's rights to privacy. And you can try to put up all the technical barriers you want to, but I honestly at the day think training is the most important thing we can do. And then after that, enforcement is vital so that people do understand there are consequences. In the future, yet yeah, we're going to have the ability to, to put um, software and, and systems in place that will allow us to, to, to better tune privacy. But at the end of the day, people still need to know that there's the right and the wrong, and they need to do the right. Um, I wanted to show you a commercial really quickly. Hopefully I can do it on this.